This is Duke University. Hi, my name is Tom Prendergast and I'm a third year doctoral student in the history department here at Duke. I study modern Europe, intellectual history, Jewish history, and the history of the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, I also organize the Jews and Muslims working group for the Society of Fellows here at the Council for European Studies. And today I'm joined, with, joined by James Neely, who is also a fellow in the society. And we're going to be talking about our research, uh, about the society, our workshops, and uh, how the society has helped us as we begin to uh, formulate our dissertations. So let me begin by telling you a little bit about my research. Um, I'm in interested in the question of how empires around the turn of the 20th century attempted to legitimize themselves in an era of rising nationalism and how they attempted to challenge the idea um, that was in increasingly popular, the idea that empires were anachronistic, that they were destined to collapse and were artificial. Um, I do this by focusing on four sociologists who were really pioneering figures at the time who established in, in, the, uh, in the dual monarchy the fields of, of political sociology, legal sociology, sociology of ideas. And these figures uh, came from the margins of the empire, sociologically speaking and also geographically. I argue that this sort of, the fact that they came from the margins of, of the empire and of European society gave them a unique perspective on prevailing ideas, of the prevailing ideas of the time. Um, one of those ideas being um, the idea of the nation state. They had a very unique perspective because of their, of their marginal status. And they used the social sciences to forge a new, uh, a new theoretical paradigm that was pro-imperial and uh, a paradigm that could legitimize the Habsburg state to which they were um, attached um, uh, to which they were very loyal. Um, so that's, that's essentially my research. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your research. So uh, in a focus on uh, history of modern Russia, I'm specifically interested in what happened to the Soviet working class between 1953, that is Joseph Stalin's death, and 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. There's a conventional narrative that suggests that by the mid-1930s, the Soviet social structure, specifically the working class, essentially froze and failed to evolve. I argue that this narrative rests upon rather narrow methodological perspectives that attempt to, um, that attempt to analyze one, Communist Party discourse, or two, attempt to locate revolutionary political uh, consciousness at the point of production. So I adopt a broad perspective and look at how uh, social scientists considered the Soviet working class, how uh, the working class was portrayed in culture and print media, and how the trade unions represented the working class. And if we look at the working class from these views, from a broader perspective, we see dramatic change between 1953 and 1991. If we, if we look at the Soviet Union, if we look at the Soviet working class and Soviet social structure from these perspectives, we see that uh, not only did the Soviet working class grow, but also it changed socially. That is, there were significantly more types of jobs, and workers themselves also be became to look different. The Soviet Union was a significantly um, more affluent society by the 60s, and especially the 70s and the beginning of the 1980s. Thus, people not only worked in different jobs, but they also appeared different. So by highlighting these changes, I, one, aim to complicate the, the notion that uh, the second half of the, Soviet, of the Soviet century was defined by stagnation, and two, I attempt to show that many of the changes that happened in the Soviet social structure mirror those that occurred in the West. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm actually interested in doing something similar myself. I think if you look at sociological discourse, you begin to get a very different view of the Habsburg monarchy. Um, there's this traditional idea that in historiography that somehow intellectuals in this space in, in East Central Europe generally had these kind of pathological ideas that they were pathologically nationalist or um, chauvinistic in their outlook. But there was also simultaneously 
a, um, a, a kind of counter discourse um, that was pro-imperial and that was um, actually that attempted to deconstruct the idea of, of the nation state. Um, so it seems like we have a lot in common in terms of our um, thematic interests in the social sciences and how that changes um, or overturns established narratives in the, histori in the historiography on. And that's something that I've, I've found very uh, useful about the uh, Society of Fellows is the fact that we're able to come together people from different disciplines working on different topics and um, gain exposure both to um, very thematically similar projects and very thematically dissimilar projects. I'm wondering what you've gotten out of the society and if you've had a similar experience. Right, I've, I've had a similar experience. I also want to stress that we've had not just people from different disciplines, but people focusing on different time periods and people from throughout the triangle. They've really encouraged me to look at my work in a completely different way. So I wonder if you could tell me about what, what are your plans to do with the fellowship money? So this summer I'll be conducting some research in, uh, in Poland, in Austria, um, also in France and the Netherlands. This builds on some research actually that okay. I did last summer. Um, I'll be going to archives in uh, Krakow, Vienna, Paris. So I'll be using my money also to, uh, to continue um, studying Polish this summer. I found Polish to be very, very useful um, since a number of the figures I'm interested in were native Polish speakers. Um, and how about you? Most of my documents are in Russia and right. Moscow, but I plan to use the CES money specifically to look at papers that are at Harvard University mm -hmm. because I mentioned earlier that I'm looking at one of the lenses I use to look at the Soviet working class is through Soviet social sciences. The Soviet social sciences really um, experienced a rebirth in the late 50s and into the early 1960s. So I will use CES money to, uh, to provide a transnational view of the Soviet social science discourse that came to shape a particular way that the Soviet working class was viewed during the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So James, your research sounds fascinating and uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you, Tom.